Hello everybody and welcome to this presentation of The Elder Scrolls Lore. In The Elder Scrolls there are many stories. There are many myths and many legends. Tales of heroes and tyrants, gods and kings. Then there's Tiber Septum. At the dawn of the Second Era, Cyrodiil was ruled by Versa Duché, a Sayesi of Akavir who had usurped Emperor Remen Cyrodiil III. Upon Versa Duché's death by assassination at the hands of the Morag Tong, his son, Severian Chorak, took his place. Many years later, in the year 430 of the Second Era, Severian Chorak and all of his heirs were slaughtered by the Dark Brotherhood in a single night. The reign of the Potentates was ended, and thus began the Interregnum. With no heir to the throne, Tamriel was thrust into uncertainty and chaos. Rebellions and civil wars erupted all over the continent, as various regional rulers sought to stake out their own little kingdoms. Attacks on Tamriel were carried out by invaders from Akavir to the east, Pyandonia to the south, and from the Daedric Prince Molag Bal. Naturally, there were some claims to the title of Emperor of Cyrodiil during this time. None were properly legitimized, and none made any advance to restore the former glory of the Empire. But eventually, Tamriel's savior would come. 400 years after the death of Severian Chorak, Talos of Atmora was born. His name translates to Stormcrown in the language of the Old Elnafe, the progenitors of all intelligent life on Nern. It isn't known when Talos left his birthplace, but he spent his youth in Skyrim, living among the Nords and learning their ways. He studied their abundant history of warfare and tactics. It also seems that Talos was born with an innate understanding of the Thum, and was quick to master it. At the age of 20, Talos was in the employ of King Kulakane, a petty, insignificant ruler who had managed to gain a modicum of power over his small domain in this chaotic time. Kulakane controlled the Kolovian Estates, a region of northwestern Cyrodiil including parts of southern Skyrim. Talos would give Kulakane the edge he needed to expand his territory. The first step would be to secure his northern border. The land of the Western Reach has been contested between the Nords and the Reachmen for practically as long as men have lived on Tamriel. This time was no exception. Kulakane needed the area to be tamed, and sent his new Atmoran general to get it done. Talos personally led his Kolovian troops along with a contingent of Nord Berserkers onto the battlefield. They fought the Witchmen of the Reach and drove them into a retreat. The Reachmen fell back beyond the walls of Old Hraldan. Talos shouted the walls down. After this decisive victory, the Greybeards issued a call, announcing that they were about to speak. Talos climbed the steps to High Hrothgar. He went before the Greybeards, and when they spoke his name, the world shook. Talos was then prophesied to rule all of Tamriel. General Talos continued to lead Kulakane's armies to victorious battles. In one year's time, the King's Realm had grown to encompass all of Western Cyrodiil. Next, they would expand into the Eastern Heartlands. They captured the White Gold Tower, and the ruling battle mages of the Nibine Valley surrendered. King Kulakane then controlled all of Cyrodiil, and thus proclaimed himself Emperor. It was then that some of the other powers of Tamriel took notice. The controlling interests of Skyrim and High Rock apparently saw the ascendance of Emperor Kulakane as a threat significant enough to launch a joint invasion. They quickly took control of all the major passes into northern Cyrodiil. Situated in one of these passes is the ancient alien city of Sankar Tor. Sankar Tor was the site of Saint Alessia's divine council with Akatosh, where she was gifted the Amulet of Kings, and where her righteous rebellion against the aliens began. The Nord and Breton commanders of the invading armies made their winter headquarters in Sankar Tor, believing the fortress to be impregnable. Talos led a small army into the pass, and stationed them in the lowlands beneath the citadel during the dead of winter. The Nord Breton leadership saw this unusually foolish move by the legendary general, and jumped at the chance to defeat him. They sent the majority of their troops out of the fortress and into battle. 
Meanwhile, a Breton turncoat led General Talos, along with a small contingent of men, to a hidden path through the mountains behind the fortress, where he then revealed the magically concealed entrance. While the armies clashed, Talos entered the citadel, wiped out the meager garrison, and captured the commanding officers. Upon seeing his might and hearing his thum, the Nord leaders abandoned their alliance with the Bretons and swore undying fealty to Talos. The High Rock Battle Mage Command were executed, their army sent back in defeat. Within Sankertor, Talos discovers the tomb of Emperor Remen Cyrodiil III. There he finds and claims the hallowed Amulet of Kings. Talos would later state that this was his true goal in sacking Sankertor. The Empire of Cyrodiil was bolstered by their new alliance with Skyrim. This did not protect them, however, from the wrath of the Western Reach. Their crushing defeat at the hands of Kulikane and General Talos still fresh in their memories. The Witchmen send a lone Nightblade to infiltrate the Imperial Palace. Once inside, the assassin kills Emperor Kulikane, cuts Talos' throat, sets the palace ablaze, and escapes. As the structure of the palace crumbles around him, Talos emerges from the flames, one hand to his throat, the other grasping the imperial crown. There was no debate of who would be named Emperor of Cyrodiil in the wake of Kulikane's death. Besides being a charismatic leader and brilliant tactician, Talos was able to don the Amulet of Kings. This combined with his natural affinity for the Thum suggests that Talos carried the blood of the dragons, blessing of Akatosh. Never before or since was there a more worthy successor to Alessia's legacy. Talos was named as the true Emperor of Cyrodiil, and took the Cyrodiilic name Tiber Septum, as well as the Nordic name of kings, Izmir, Dragon of the North. What immediately followed was a period of great restoration. The centuries without central rule had not been kind to Cyrodiil's infrastructure. Cities and roads long neglected were rebuilt. The rise of Septim also allowed East and West Cyrodiil to unite and form a bond stronger than ever before. It was then time for the Empire to expand and for Talos to fulfill his destiny. Within the 20 years that followed, Skyrim was incorporated as an imperial province, followed by High Rock, both through diplomatic means. Hammerfell followed suit soon after. Being previously embroiled by brutal civil war, the Red Guards welcomed the order and security which the Empire provided. Accounts differ, so it's unclear as to where exactly Tiber Septim's campaign turned next. What is certain is that the elves and bestial races of the continent would be far less receptive to Septim's sovereignty. The previously unconquerable Morrowind was invaded by the joint armies of Cyrodiil and Skyrim. It isn't stated for how long the Dunmer held out. The Tribunal were formidable foes, to be sure. Yet even they proved to be no match for Tiber Septim's brilliance in warfare. The Dark Elves eventually capitulated, signing a mutual treaty before the invasion could advance into the kingdom's interior. Thus, Morrowind was made an imperial province. Information on the conquests of the Argonians and Khajiit is very, very scarce. One thing we do know is that this was only a few centuries after the outbreak of the Kanaten flu, which had ravaged both nations. Though the flu itself was long gone by this point, they had likely not yet fully recovered from the effects of it. They would have been weak to attack. Both nations were apparently conquered in similar fashion to Morrowind. Their border and coastal regions were assaulted by imperial forces until they were convinced that further resistance was futile. The innermost regions of Black Marsh and elsewhere were never fully invaded, yet they too succumbed to imperial control under the glorious Tiber Septum. As far as the High Elves and Bosmer are concerned, there's really not much to tell. All who were open to the righteous rule of Tiber Septum were welcome subjects of the Empire. All who stood in the way of his divine vision were crushed without mercy. Emperor Tiber's illustrious campaign lasted over four decades after the unification of Cyrodiil. When the dust settled, Septim's destiny was fulfilled, his empire encompassing all of Tamriel. 
the beginning of a new age was declared, the dawn of the third era of mankind. Tiber's reign lasted another 38 years until his death at the age of 108. Rule of the empire passed to his grandson, Pelagius Septim I. When Tiber died, his soul ascended to the plane of Aetherius, something which no other mortal has ever accomplished. He would then be known again by his birth name, Talos, the Ninth Divine. But did he really? The ascension of Talos was a singular event, never having been done before or since as far as we know. No one can logically explain how this was done, so did he really do it? There actually is some compelling evidence which suggests that he did. First, there's this person. His name is Wolf. He appeared out of nowhere at the Fortress of Ghostgate in Morrowind, just before the fall of Dagoth Ur. There he gave brief counsel to the Nerevarine on their way to kill the mad self-made god, and offered them an old coin as a token of luck. After the destruction of Dagoth Ur, Wolf disappeared. The Nerevarine felt the power emanating from the coin. It was more than a mere trinket, so they brought it to the Oracle of the Imperial Cult for examination. She explained to the Nerevarine that the person they met was in fact an aspect of Talos. What stake he had in the events of Red Mountain during that time and why he would appear to the Nerevarine is a mystery. There's more which lends credence to Talos's divinity. During the Oblivion Crisis at the end of the Third Era, Martin Septim, the last of Tiber's bloodline, sought to open a portal to Mankar Cameron's paradise. Cameron held the Amulet of Kings, which was needed in order to relight the Dragonfires and halt Mehrun's Dagon's invasion. A crucial component needed to create the portal was the blood of a divine. Divines do not routinely present themselves on Nern, so this was a problem. Talos, however, used to be mortal and left traces of himself behind. Martin sent the Hero of Kavach to Sankar Tor, which held the tomb of Tiber Septim. Left along with his mortal remains was Tiber Septim's armor. The champion retrieved the armor and brought it to Martin, who was able to extract a small sample of Tiber's blood by scraping the inside of the armor. Using those scrapings, Martin Septim was able to open the portal. If the blood of a divine was a necessary component of the ritual, then the fact that Tiber's blood sufficed would prove that he truly did become a divine after his death. When the Empire was forced to surrender to the wretched elves of the Aldmeri Dominion in the Fourth Era, one condition was the outright ban of Talos worship. This obviously shook the foundations of those faithful to the Nine Divines in the Empire, particularly the Nords. There's no doubt that the Altmer had a political agenda behind the banning of Talos. However, there are some who discount that and maintain that banishing Talos was the morally correct thing to do. They argue that Tiber Septim accomplished his great deeds as a mortal, and that labeling him as a divine trivializes his human achievements. There's little doubt that Talos ascended to the ranks of the gods after his death. Similar to Lorcan, however, where the debate lies is whether or not Talos should be worshipped as a divine. For many reasons of their own, the Altmer say no. Regardless of politics, Talos of Atmora remains in the hearts of all true believers, who hope someday to be able to honor mankind's greatest hero openly again. So that pretty well sums up Tiber Septim. He truly was a noble, venerable leader whose just conquest of Tamriel was a benefit for all citizens of the Third Empire. This was pretty nice. For once I set out to tell a simple story and I was able to do just that. Yep, there's definitely nothing else to cover when it comes to Tiber- What, that? Well, I mean, that was one incident. I know it doesn't look good, but I don't think- yeah, but the guy who wrote that clearly has an axe to grind. It's highly biased. And besides, there's nothing else that corroborates any part of that story- uh, Oh, alright. There's a bit more to cover here. Unfortunately though, we are running short on time, and I'm going to need as much of it as possible for this next part. The tale of Tiber Septim is to be continued. This has been Double Negative. Thank you very much for watching. 
I will see you on the next presentation of The Elder Scrolls Lore.